Welcome to Calvary Albuquerque. We pursue the God who is passionately pursuing a lost world. We do this with one another. Through worship, by the word, to the world. Why is the issue of biblical uh, inerrancy, uh, of biblical revelation, of a reliable uh, word from God so important? Uh, we will show you this, first of all, in cartoon form. This is one of the classic Far Side cartoons. Why, why did the cartoonist retire? Uh, he was vital uh, to modern civilization. In the first panel, you see God phoning. Hello, hello, this is God, who is this? Uh, this is Ernie Miller, sir. Ernie who? Is this 5551728? No, sir, this is 5551782. Sorry, wrong number, right, wrong number. And for the rest of his life, Ernie told his friends that he had talked with God. <laughs> Which, of course, he had. The problem is that he received absolutely no information through this contact. None whatever. It is not enough simply to believe in God. The scripture tells us that the devils also believe and tremble. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said, God is the apex of all human thought. He is superior to everything, and therefore, he is not even aware of the creation. If he were aware of it, it would depress him because it isn't on his level. So uh, God is there in eternity, and all he's doing is thinking about himself because that is the highest good. Now, that's very interesting. Uh, and uh, there are people in the intelligent design movement who think that all you've got to do is to maintain that there is a God, a source, an intelligent source for the universe, and the basis of uh, the organized uh, nature of our world uh, and the stuff in it. Trouble with all of this is that unless we receive some message from God, some word from God that indicates to us what life really means, what's expected of us, uh, if we are out of a relationship with God, how we get back into it, unless we have something like this, merely believing in God is really of, of little consequence. It's not enough to receive a phone call and it's the wrong number. What we need is to have a, a, a God who loves us enough that he has provided us with, uh, as it were, a constitution for our lives uh, and a message uh, of what he expects of us. That's why it is so important to know if there is such a revelation and uh, if there are claims to such revelations, uh, whether those claims can be sustained. Let me say something about the decline of biblical authority in uh, Western life. Uh, if you go back to the time of the Reformation, for example, or back into the Middle Ages, you find that all Christian believers held that the Bible is the very word of God. It is correct from stem to stern, from front to back. Everything in it is uh, God's own uh, message to us. Uh, indeed, uh, Augustine, the great fifth century church father, said this explicitly. Uh, and at the time of the Reformation, Luther and Calvin said this explicitly. Uh, the idea was uh, that uh, if there were a revelation at all, it would need to be uh, a reliable revelation and a clear word so that we could base our lives uh, and the plan of salvation upon it. By the time of the Italian Renaissance, uh, a critical approach to literature entered into the picture. 
A gentleman by the name of Lorenzo Valla uh, criticized uh, various alleged papal documents. Uh, one of these, <laughs> the so-called uh, donation of Constantine, was supposed to have been uh, done by, uh, the, uh, by the Pope in relation to the Emperor Constantine, and the Emperor Constantine gave over the temporal authority in Christendom to the papacy. <clears throat> Uh, this document, Lorenzo Valla, proved to be a forgery, and it was a forgery which was created in the papal chancery itself, which was a rather uh, un, un, unhappy conclusion uh, for those who were very strongly allied to the Roman Church. Lorenzo Valla did not apply those kinds of critical operations to the Bible, but later on, uh, attempts were made to uh, unsettle the idea that the Bible was entirely reliable. And here we move to the 18th century. Uh, people like Thomas Paine in his book, The Age of Reason, uh, the second half of The Age of Reason, consists simply of examples of biblical errors and contradictions, according to Thomas Paine. Uh, and uh, in France, there were the encyclopedists, and in England, the deists. In the 19th century, uh, the situation became even uh, less attractive because uh, the Darwinian theory, evolutionary theory, moved into place toward the middle of the century, uh, and uh, it attempted to uh, argue that you don't need uh, a god at all, much less a scripture. The 18th century deists had said, we're going to substitute the book of nature for the book of scripture. Uh, but by the 19th century, as people looked at nature, it didn't seem to point to God any longer. It seemed to, simply to be a, a natural operation, natural selection, and the like. And so, a type of criticism of the Bible uh, appeared. This is called uh, higher criticism or documentary criticism, and what it did was to say that the Bible may look like it is the work of the authors uh, whose names are associated with it, but really the Bible is the product of uh, strands of, of, of material that have been brought together and rather clumsily by later editors, and uh, what you have there is not a book that can be relied upon for its historical data or for the facts that it sets forth. Uh, it is instead a kind of poetic religious affair. Yes, and uh, that approach to the Old Testament in the 19th century moved to the New Testament in the 20th century. And so we had uh, especially German scholars uh, who said the four Gospels really don't give us anything uh, that we uh, can rely upon concerning Jesus Christ. Uh, what you have there are simply the uh, results of belief that existed in the early church. Different churches had different thoughts about Jesus, and these were pasted together in one way or another uh, to result in the Gospels as we have them today. Uh, there was an attempt, for example, uh, to produce a Bible that would have different colored um, uh, words uh, in it uh, to represent the different strands of material that allegedly were able to be pasted together. And <laughs> this Bible was never, never uh, produced. Why? Because the liberal scholars who did this kind of thing couldn't agree among themselves where one of these strands began and another left off. So the thing was never actually published. And the uh, current Jesus Seminar, this uh, group of liberal scholars who still continue this kind of thing, uh, have realized that there's going to be disagreement. So what they do is to use colored balls and they vote. Uh, they, they vote at their meetings as to what stuff in the New Testament is definitely Jesus, not very much, uh, what stuff is probably from Jesus, what stuff is likely not to be from Jesus, and stuff that certainly isn't. Uh, so the idea here is to get a subscription because you're going to need to know on a monthly basis uh, you know, what uh, material in the New Testament is reliable and what material isn't. Uh, this has uh, allowed the the view of scripture to descend very largely to a matter of subjective opinion. What's happened here? In one of my books, uh, The Law Above the Law, I argue that uh, 
uh, it isn't accidental that we have arrived at the point we have uh, in our Western ideology. Uh, I use these three phrases. The Bible died in the 18th century in the sense that uh, nature, the book of nature, was substituted for the book of scripture. So instead of people going to the Bible to find out uh, what God wanted, uh, they thought that they could find this by looking at nature in general, all right? Then, in the 19th century, for goodness sake, uh, nature no longer pointed to God because of evolutionary theory. So in the 19th century, God died. And indeed, at the end of the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche coined that phrase, God is dead. Uh, there, were, <clears throat> there were some uh, humorists at that time who, who opposed two letters. The first letter, uh, this is uh, a letter uh, that reads, God is dead, signed Nietzsche. But then 20 years later, there's a second letter, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> But in terms of ideas, in the 19th century, uh, God went the same way as the Bible went in the 18th century. And in the 20th century, what was the result? 20th century is the century where human beings have slaughtered more of their fellow human beings than in the sum total of centuries preceding. Uh, the 20th century, with its two world wars, with the hideous atrocities that took place, uh, is probably the bloodiest uh, in human annals, and with in the century with the most human rights violations. Why is that? Well, it's perfectly simple. If there's no longer a God, you no longer have any absolute principles. There isn't any morality left at all. You can then do whatever you can get away with. Might makes right. So, uh, if the best evidence of God comes from Holy Scripture because he entered history in Jesus Christ, if that's the case, it's inevitable that if you lose your confidence in Scripture, that's going to reduce your uh, belief in God and the basis for your belief in God, and that in turn is going to destroy human value. It's not accidental at all. Uh, the, the, the maintaining confidence in Holy Scripture is, is vital because without that, uh, you're going to have a, a regression of this kind almost inevitably. A sociologist by the name of Jeffrey Haddon did a survey some years ago of the belief of Protestant clergy in the reliability of the Bible. And he did this across denominations. And the result of this survey is very interesting. Uh, there were only two denominations that maintained officially and consistently the inerrancy of scripture in the United States, only two. They were the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and the Southern Baptist Church, okay? But the survey dealt with clergy of uh, virtually all uh, major American denominations. And the survey showed that in the denominations across the board, the younger the clergyman, the less likely he would believe in the inerrancy of scripture. The older the clergyman, the more likely he would hold to the full authority of scripture. Now, why, why were those the, the results? Well, the, re the, the reason, of course, is that the theological seminaries of the various churches have gone down the drain, and it's there that the younger clergy are trained. Uh, the lesson that comes out of this <coughs> is <laughs> that it is absolutely essential to have solid theological training for clergy. <laughs> if you don't have that, your clergy are going to uh, end up in the condition that the Haddon survey indicates. All right, I realize that that is dull and historical, but I thought that it couldn't hurt you if I presented it. We're going to begin our case for the authority of scripture with a statistical argument. Now this doesn't show the inerrancy of scripture, but what it does do is to get your attention. If the Bible satisfies the criteria that we're going to see it does, 
then it is a unique book. There's no other book like it. Uh, and it therefore uh, behooves us to examine even more closely uh, how uh, accurate and reliable it is in all respects. This is a statistical argument. And there it is, and every one of you will enjoy reading that, I know. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, particularly those of you who have a good ophthalmologist. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, this, argument, this argument is based upon the use of the product rule. The product rule is a standard statistical rule. The product rule uh, tells us uh, what the likelihood is uh, that a number of events, independent events, uh, will occur in exactly the same manner as a single event. What you do here is to establish arbitrarily the probability of one single event coming out. And once you've done this, you can then, on the basis of this formula, determine the probabilities if a considerable number of similar events, but independent events, also come out that way. The formula is, as you see from this, 1 over x. And x represents, the, the 1 over x, uh, represents the probability of one event. So let's say the chances of a given event uh, is 50-50. That's 1 over 2. Or suppose the probability of an event occurring is 1 4, uh, is, is 25%. That's 1 fourth. Now, you raise the denominator to the number of e similar but independent events in order to determine what the likelihood is of those events coming about. Why do I go into all of this? Because the scripture contains innumerable prophecies of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And many of these prophecies are fulfilled specifically in the New Testament. So, Let's take the probability of any one of these prophecies uh, coming about by mere chance. Let's arbitrarily make that 50-50, 1 over 2, right? But then if we take 25 prophecies in the Old Testament, and that's a conservative number, we would raise the denominator, the 2, 1 over 2, we raise the denominator 25 times. We multiply 2 by itself 25 times. And what do we get? The chances against 25 prophecies coming true, if only one of them uh, uh, is at 50-50, the chances uh, against this happening would be, ha-ha, 1 in 33 million. 1 in 33 million. But of course, uh, the chances of any one prophecy coming out is uh, in, in the life of Christ uh, would, would hardly be 50-50. Uh, hmm? How about this one? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now you can check at the hospitals locally. The, <laughs> the, the, the probability of this occurring is considerably below 50-50, all right? So let's take the probability of any one of these events as 25%. That's 1 over 4. Then you're raising the 4 25 times. 4 multiplied by itself 25 times. Now at this point, you can either use an adding machine uh, or you can find a small Chinese with an abacus uh, and <clears throat> you can work this out. Uh, and you need to trust me, uh, under those circumstances, uh, the probabilities <clears throat> would be one in a thousand trillion against this coming out by chance. One in a thousand trillion. The mathematician who first worked this out in relation to the prophecies uh, said this concerning the whole business. Since there are many more than 25 prophecies of events surrounding the birth and life of Christ, and a compromised chance of success is undoubtedly less than one to four, then the chance of success, if these prophecies were all mere guesses, would be so infinitesimal that no one could maintain that these prophecies were mere guesses. The alternative must be true. These prophecies were all foreseen events in which holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The prophecies were given by revelation, divinely inspired. Now, if this is a sound argument, and it surely is because the prophecies are independent, the prophecies uh, come from all the books of the, a vast number of books of the Old Testament, uh, they aren't 
uh, related to each other by any kind of logical connection, if they're independent, then this argument is sound. The only way you could get around it would, would be by saying that the prophecies were actually written after the fulfillments. <laughs> which of course is impossible uh, because we know that the Old Testament existed before the New Testament. Yes, we know that. Uh, the only other way of getting out of this would be to say, well, uh, uh, Jesus or the apostles conformed his life to fit the prophecies, to make it appear that these were fulfillments, but they, this was actually arranged. Why doesn't that work? It doesn't work, as we pointed out last night, because of the hostile witnesses to the life of Christ who were alive when these gospel materials were circulated. Those Jewish religious leaders would never have allowed the writers of the New Testament to get away with false statements about fulfilled prophecy. They knew the Old Testament. That was their field. And they had the means, the motive, and the opportunity, to use the lawyer's expression, uh, to blow the whistle on this stuff if it were not accurate. So the only ways that you could get around this will fail, and that leaves you with a very interesting book. It's a book which... Uh, the Old Testament part of it, uh, throughout, points to a single figure, Jesus Christ, who literally fulfills those prophecies. Now, this doesn't demonstrate the inerrancy of every word of the Old Testament, but it certainly suggests that we're dealing with a very, very special kind of book. All right, now let's get to the case for inerrancy. Here's the crux argument. And those of you who are here Monday night and Tuesday night will see that everything but the last point here, we've already dealt with. We already covered that. And for those poor souls who are not here on either Monday or Tuesday, you shouldn't have any difficulty in seeing how the argument works. We're not going to go into the details of the first points, but you can easily fill in on your own uh, by reading, uh, or you might even listen to a recording, I suppose, of what occurred on Monday and Tuesday night. If the New Testament documents are reliable, and they are, reliable as ordinary historical documents, and if Jesus claims to be God Almighty in these documents, which he surely does, and if the uh, testimonies presented about all of this uh, are sound, if these testimonies are sound, if the witnesses are sound, and finally Jesus rises again from the dead to demonstrate that he is exactly the person he claims to be. What you have then is the presence of God Almighty here on earth. That's what you have. And it follows then that anything he were to say on any subject would need to be accepted. Why? Well, if he's God Almighty, he's forgotten more about anything than you'll ever know. All right? So, uh, you are not in a position to question what he has to say. He will be the final authority on anything where he pronounces. Now, he did not pronounce on a lot of things. For example, refrigerator repair. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there doesn't seem to be anything in the uh, teaching of our Lord concerning refrigerator repair. And uh, this, by the way, is the reason why uh, we have so much trouble with our refrigerators. <laughs> but he did have a great deal to say about the authority of the Bible. He had a great deal to say about the Old Testament, and as we'll see proleptically, he had equivalent things to say about the New Testament. If Jesus, God Almighty, tells us that the Bible is completely reliable, that settles the question right there. It means that if problems arise, uh, difficulties, alleged contradictions, errors, or anything like that, there's got to be a way of resolving them. They can never be absolute epidictic errors. There's got to be some way to resolve them because God Almighty knows more about this subject than you do or I do. 
Let's see what he had to say about the Old Testament first, and then let us see what he had to say about the New Testament, which wasn't yet in existence. I, I hope you appreciate the ar artistry of, of, of this. Yes, yes. All right, uh, as to the Old Testament, there are innumerable specific passages where Jesus treats the Old Testament as God's word without qualification. Uh, uh, and I've listed a number of them there. These will be very familiar to you and there's no reason for me to go into them in any detail. Uh, the, uh, the, the passages where Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken, etc., can be found with no difficulty whatsoever. There are these specific passages. But it's also very interesting to see how he treated theological and other issues uh, in terms of the Old Testament. He never criticizes the Old Testament. He goes beyond the Old Testament, but he never criticizes it. He says, it's been said of old time, uh, you shall not commit adultery. If a person lusts after a woman in his heart, uh, it is the equivalent of, of uh, committing adultery. Uh, it's been said of old time in the Old Testament, you shall not kill. But if you hate your brother, uh, this is the uh, equivalent of it. Now, what's Jesus doing there? He is not contradicting the Old Testament. He is certainly not saying, uh, you, you really shouldn't hate, but go out and kill somebody. It's no problem at all. Uh, or uh, uh, don't lust, but uh, adultery is okay. You know, this, he's, he's not saying anything like that. He is saying not only is the Old Testament correct, but also we have the interiorizing of it. That is to say, uh, our thoughts and our ideas should be conformed to all of that. Uh, the fascinating thing is that if today you were to go out onto the street here in Albuquerque and you were to ask the average person what passages of the Old Testament are the least of, uh, believable today, they would almost certainly say the Adam and Eve story, Noah and the flood, and Jonah and the whale. Surprise! Jesus believed in the historicity of each of those events, and those are the toughest. Uh, in the case of Adam and Eve, they said to him, didn't Moses give a bill of divorcement? Jesus said, yes, but from the beginning it was not so. And then he talks about the Genesis story, Genesis 3, uh, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two shall be of one flesh. Jesus is saying that the Adam and Eve story is earlier and is uh, the, the ultimate authority in relation to the question of divorce. How about the, uh, Noah and the flood? Jesus parallels this with his own second coming. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes again. Uh, they were eating and drinking, uh, and the flood took them, and it'll be like that at the end of time. Jesus is certainly not going to parallel a non-historical event with his second coming, which is a historical reality in the future. And Jesus says there's only one sign given to this wicked generation. It's the sign of Jonah. Uh, as he was in the beast, uh, so uh, uh, I will be in the earth and I shall rise again. He parallels his resurrection from the dead to what happens in the case of, of Jonah. Uh, in incidentally, uh, we don't know if it was a whale. We don't know. Uh, uh, in the Hebrew, it is a beast. It, it behemoth, it's a beast. And since it was doing the backstroke, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, authorized version translators uh, thought of the biggest uh, sea beast they could, uh, they could imagine, and that was the whale. But it could have been. It could have been a special beast provided for the occasion, a beast that preferred cuisine au Jonas. <clears throat> And it's highly significant the way Jesus deals with the devil in the wilderness. In, this is a passage in all uh, three of the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, what does the devil do? He quotes scripture. He says, he says uh, uh, turn these stones into bread. 
And what is Jesus' reply? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus is saying the trouble with you, devil, is that you take this stuff out of context. You have got to take the entire totality of the Old Testament revelation in order to understand what it's really saying. All right. If you look at all of this, there is no question but what Jesus held to the inerrancy of the, of the Old Testament. The Jews of his time did. Uh, there was a Harvard dean some years ago who said, yes, yes, they all thought that, but of course we know better today. We know better today because of higher criticism. Uh, if I had had contact with that Harvard dean, and I certainly didn't, I'm a Cornelian, why would I even speak to the dean of the Harvard Divinity School? Well, uh, but if I, if I had had contact with such a person, I would have said this. Uh, Jesus' view was different than, from yours. And he rose again from the dead. Have you risen again from the dead? And if you haven't, do you mind that I prefer his uh, approach to the Old Testament to your approach to the Old Testament? Hmm? <laughs> now, what about the New Testament? Uh, you say, how could Jesus possibly have said anything about the New Testament when it wasn't even in existence? This has to do with a specific promise that he gave to his apostles. This is a unique promise. Now, in some church circles, they try to apply this to every last Christian believer, but this was a specific promise to the apostles. And you will find this in John 14 and 16. Jesus says, it's expedient that I go away because the Holy Spirit will come and he will bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have told you. Okay? Uh, Oscar Kuhlmann, the great uh, Strasbourg and Basel theologian, said this was the gift of total recall. Total recall. This is why the early church collected the books of apostles or close associates of apostles, and those went into the New Testament. Okay? Because if a book had been written by a close associate of an apostle, then the apostles would have checked on the accuracy of it. Apostolic authority then was the key because of this special gift of the Holy Spirit which preserved the doctrinal understanding of the apostles uh, to what Jesus had actually told them. You say, well, that's very interesting, but, but what about St. Paul? Most of the books of the New Testament are written by St. Paul. All right. After Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road, he went uh, to the original apostolic company. Well, he knocks on the door. Hi there, he says. You think it's Saul. It's no longer Saul. It is now Paul, the apostle. Uh, and I have been appointed out of due time as the apostle to the Gentiles. At that point, the original apostolic company could have done one of two things. Hmm? Uh, could have done uh, either of two things. They could either have bounced him out into the street uh, because they rejected this as nonsense, or they could have accepted him. And they accepted him. They had been given the gift of total recall in order to make it possible for them to determine what was genuinely Jesus' teaching and what wasn't. In contact with Paul, they agreed that Paul was presenting uh, the original teaching, and therefore he was accepted into the apostolic company. You can find evidence of this in the New Testament itself. If you take a look at 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, a passage that is passed over almost, almost always, uh, if you look at this carefully, it says there, Peter says, People are twisting Paul's writings as they do the other scriptures. And the expression for other scriptures there is tagraphe, uh, that's the Old Testament. Huh? So Peter is classifying Paul's writings as scripture right there within the New Testament itself. So the whole of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, turn out to be uh, reliable in terms of Jesus' own uh, assertions.
I'm now just going to say a word or two, because we're getting to the end of our time, uh, a word or two uh, about the problems that exist in evangelical circles, not here, of course, not in Albuquerque, uh, but uh, in, in evangelical circles in general. Uh, there is a brand of evangelicalism that is known as liberal evangelicalism. Uh, we won't mention any institutions such as the Fuller Theological Seminary in California. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, at, uh, in these contexts, it is said that the Bible is reliable theologically and maybe even ethically, but you don't have to consider it reliable in secular areas like uh, what geography, history, science, and the like. What's the trouble with this? Well, there are two fundamental problems with it. Uh, first is a uh, epistemological problem, a problem dealing with the nature of truth. All areas of knowledge are interlocked. Uh, I, you could check the, 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 the universe very carefully and you will find no lines cleanly drawn between physics and chemistry, between chemistry and biology, between biology and physiology, uh, history, religion, morals. All of these are aspects of the human condition and they all interlock. Therefore, if you say that the Bible can have errors in so-called secular matters, there will be no way to separate this from the theological uh, errors uh, that you don't want to believe exist there. Uh, take, for example, um, the death of Christ on the cross. Was that a historical uh, issue or was it a theological issue? That's like the question if you stopped beating your wife. Any, any answer to that is going to get you into terrific difficulty. Uh, the death of Christ on the cross was a historical event in ordinary history. And it is the greatest and most important theological event of all time. If it didn't occur historically, it's of no value theologically. Uh, in Christianity, God comes to earth. He enters the human condition. He enters the secular. And so all the way through the Bible, you're going to have prophets engaged in uh, ordinary activities. You're going to have apostles preaching in ordinary cities. You're going to have our Lord giving uh, his ministry to people in the, in the real world. And so there is no way in the world that you can separate the so-called uh, secular from the theological. And when you try to do this, the problem is, of course, that uh, the errors that you find or think you find in the secular realm uh, 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 impinge upon the theological realm. So eventually, you are questioning the theology. And uh, out at Fuller Seminary, there was a professor some years ago uh, who finally said, well, you know, Paul was, was, was mistaken when it came to, uh, the, to, to the place of the woman in the church, women's rights and so forth. Paul didn't understand that. Once you've gotten to that point, then you are criticizing the morals, the ethics, the theology of, of the whole business. So uh, how do you handle alleged contradictions and errors? I give you a technique. Think of this as a balance scale. You can all see me, here we are. Into this pan of the balance, you put the problem passage, the alleged error, the so-called contradiction, the difficulty. Into this pan, you put the, uh, the, the, uh, the non-Christian's allegation against scripture. Or you can put a whole pile of them in there if you want. Into this pan of the balance, you put Jesus' view of the Bible. Since Jesus' view of the Bible is God's view of the Bible, the balance scale is always going to weigh this like this, no matter how much is over here. Now, this is no excuse for being cavalier about problems, and you ought to get into your library some good books that deal with alleged biblical errors and contradictions. But even if you find some awfully difficult uh, passages uh, and, and difficulties, they are never going to outweigh our Lord's view of Scripture. And that's why we can maintain the inerrancy of Scripture, even though there may still be unsolved problems.
I, I mentioned just one uh, illustration uh, so that to give you confidence in this regard. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, it appears that Jesus was crucified on uh, one day of the Jewish month of Nisan, and in the Gospel of John, it appears that he was crucified on another day of the Jewish month of Nisan. There's a 14th and uh, 15th Nisan uh, conflict, apparently. When Calvin tried to resolve this, he said, I have no way of knowing uh, how to resolve it, but this is God's word, there's got to be an answer. Well, in the Dead Sea Scroll discoveries 30 years ago, the French Dead Sea Scroll specialist, Jobert, Madame Jobert, found a calendar that was used alongside the ordinary uh, civil calendar. And this calendar is now called the Jubilees Qumran calendar. And that exactly explains that one of these dates and the ordinary civil lunar calendar exactly explains the other. There was no way of knowing this until his calendar turned up. But think of all of the snotty liberals who were shot down as a result of a discovery like that. And what this says is that you are always better off sticking with Jesus and his approach to the Bible than you are taking a critical attitude toward it. Now, finally, because I'm at the end of my time and uh, I think there's a trap door that will drop me into the basement. <clears throat> Uh, this uh, this uh, whole operation is so sophisticated, there's bound to be a trap door somewhere. All right. Uh, from a personal standpoint, why is this so important? Because, as it says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There is only one way to increase faith, and that is by way of God's message to us. The Bible is the way in which you can increase faith. The reformers talked about it as a means of grace, a means of grace. God uses this to build us up as Christians. And therefore, if you question Holy Writ, you're not going to be shutting up and listening to it. You're only going to grow spiritually if you will keep your big mouth shut and simply listen to what God is saying in Scripture. And you will not be doing this unless you have the full confidence that the Bible is worth your trusting it. So, in terms of personal spiritual life, in terms of rationality, in terms of being able to witness effectively to non-Christians, the inerrancy of Scripture is critical. Thank you. What binds us together is devotion to worshiping our Heavenly Father, dedication to studying His Word, and determination to proclaim our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. For more teachings from Calvary Albuquerque and Skip Heitzig, visit calvaryabq.org.